From Microbe TV, this is Matters Microbial, a podcast about the wonders of microbiology, microbiologists, and microbial centrism. This episode was recorded on March 21st, 2024. Hello, Micronauts, and welcome once again to today's Quality Quorum. I'm your host, Dr. Mark Martin, Associate Professor of Biology at the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. Today is the 33rd episode of Matters Microbial. Those of you who watch and or listen and spread the microbial word to others, thank you so very, very much. It's no surprise to any viewer or listener that I'm quite interested in science fiction and in fossils, which takes us to the early Earth and how life originated. Are there fossils of microbes? Well, not in the way we have fossils of dinosaurs and trilobites anyway. One thing we do know is that early Earth had very little oxygen compared to today. Some scientists believe, in fact, that oxygen is a biosignature of life, and this is a topic we will discuss, biosignatures, today a little bit. It was the cyanobacteria that first linked the two photosystems and used sunlight to split water to generate high-energy electrons just to make a living, but they released oxygen as a result. There were waves of what is called the Great Oxygenation Event, link in the show notes, and as oxygen levels began to rise and change the very face of our planet, other things changed. Iron precipitates from solution differently at different oxygen concentrations. This is revealed in banded iron formations, as you see here, link again in the show notes. This situation resulted in stromatolites, layers of cyanobacteria and sediment, fossilized over time, sometimes over a billion years old. Here's one that Will Shop sent me many years ago. I even have a gunflint formation stromatolite nearly 2 billion years old. And it turns out that some of the chemical remains of these cyanobacteria can survive fossilization and give us insights into early life on our planet. To understand this, please appreciate the membrane that surrounds each of our cells, and microbial cells too. It's composed, in our case, of phospholipids that are very, very flexible. Proteins float in this phospholipid sea, carrying out various functions, and the flexibility of this membrane increases and decreases with the temperature. Thus, membranes can fly apart at high temperature or freeze solid at low. And it turns out that, for us and some other organisms, cholesterol protects membranes from these extremes. And cyanobacteria have molecules that serve the same membrane function, hopinoids. As always, the study of microbial life tells us so much about ourselves and, in turn, about the evolution of life itself. Which brings us to our guest today. Many, many, many years ago, I taught at a small liberal arts institution in Los Angeles, Occidental College, and I had a highly energetic and equally enthusiastic student named Paula who worked in my lab. Here she was at the bench. And here she is again, 22 years later, when I received the American Society for Microbiology's Karski Award for Undergraduate Education. My friend Paula is Doc Martian number four, and I couldn't be prouder. So, Paula Wielander, Associate Professor of Earth System Science at Stanford University, is an ideal choice to tell us more about ancient fats in modern microbes. Welcome to our Quality Quorum, Paula. I'm always so delighted to see you and hear about your great work. It's a long way from Eagle Rock, California, isn't it? Yes, it is. Thank you for having me, Mark. I'm very happy to. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling great. It's a good day, sunny. I'm really happy. <laughs> that's, what, that's what always works with you. In fact, I have very seldom seen you in a bad mood. So it's a tonic for all of us that go through seasonal affects. <laughs> So how about a few words about your journey that took you here? Because you have an interesting background. 
Yeah, so as you mentioned, I got my undergraduate degree at Occidental College in Eagle Rock, California. I was born and raised in Los Angeles. Um, my parents are immigrants from Mexico. Uh, they moved to the U.S. in uh, the 1970s from uh, Chihuahua. Um, and, you know, my siblings and I were all born in Los Angeles, and we were raised with this idea that education was the goal for us, even though neither one of my parents had graduated from high school. Um, and so I ended up at Oxy, where I took your molecular biology class, <laughs> molecular microbiology class, and I just really fell in love with microbes, even though I was a kinesiology major. I don't know if you remember this. <laughs> oh, I do. I, yeah, but, and, and that was really an important aspect of this because I was trying to find, I wanted some, um, after taking your lab, I wanted some research experience and I was trying to find a lab and most of the labs would only take biology students and you were the one that was willing to take the, the kinesiology student. <laughs> may, may I, may I tell you that that was the first time I had a concerted difference of opinion with my then colleagues? <laughs> yeah. Was because I'm <laughs> interested in the student and what the student can do. And I also believe that different points of view are very important in science. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and you know, that's where I fell in love with bench work. As you saw from that picture, I got a big old smile <laughs> at the bench in your lab. Um, and I did really fall in love with microbiology. And, and the struggle I had at that point was I was pre-med. I was going to be a doctor. Um, but I had at that point decided I really didn't want to go to medical school and I didn't know what to do. And it was you that pulled me aside and said, you'd be a great bench scientist. And I was like, I can get paid to do this. <laughs> I had no idea it would involve getting a PhD or anything like that. So it was really, that was very pivotal for me to be able to, um, understand the different scientific journeys I could take and that I didn't have to give up something I love, which was working at the bench to have a career. So yeah, so with your help, I ended up applying to grad school and I w ended up at the University of Illinois uh, at Urbana-Champaign with working with Bill Metcalf studying methanogens and how they make methane gas. Um, and then after um, six years at Illinois, I went to MIT where I did a postdoc with Diane Newman, um, who is now at Caltech, and Roger Sommens, who is now retired from MIT. So Roger, so Diane is a microbial physiologist, so she was kind of more in line of what I had worked on with you and with Bill. Roger, who was my co-advisor, was a geochemist. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that, you know, with Diane had said these, we find these molecules, these biosignatures in the rock record, and we don't know how to interpret them. And that was because we don't study them very much. There aren't very microbiologists studying them in our modern bugs. And so that's kind of where the intersection with microbiology and the earth record and biosignatures came about for me. And yeah, and then I applied for faculty jobs a few times and ended up here at Stanford in what was the School of Earth Sciences at the time. <laughs> it's amazing because I, I got my graduate degree there and it was so <laughs> surreal a couple of years ago when I came to visit you there. And mm. because generally speaking, I don't mean to say anything. I, 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 you know, I went to graduate school with a lot of very famous people and then there's Mark. And <laughs> so I, I'm walking around and actually you made me feel very welcome. So that was really nice to do. Awesome. <laughs> so your your studies pretty much there have gone through the gamut over the years. And I mean, some of the things that I know you best about are, are looking at some of these biosignatures of early life in fossil mm -hmm. records. Mm -hmm. And it does take us back to this idea that we don't. And, and I know that I'm I'm kind of not being terribly fair when I say there mm -hmm. aren't really good microbial fossils. Mm -hmm. But when you see spheres and rods and spirals. Yeah you know, in a rock, do you really know that they're, they're bacteria or other right. type of microbes? Mm -hmm. The fact is looking at some of these biosignatures help make that clear. Also isotope, you, you know, fractionation, yes. that kind of thing as well. Yeah. So you got interested in these hopanoids, which act to stabilize membranes and cyanobacteria mm -hmm. at a higher and lower temperatures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we got involved because they were, as you pointed out, uh, being identified in the rock record. Um, and there was one particular uh, modification that was made to these molecules that we don't understand exactly what it did to the biophysical properties of it, but it's preserved. And uh, the thing about the microbial fossils is you're right. They look like microbes, but we can't go beyond that level. And it gets back to, if you think about it, when uh, Carl Rose started um, um, initiating the idea of using phylogenetic markers like genes to identify microbes. At the time, you know, taxonomy, we use structure. 
right? And if you look at that, that didn't really provide an evolutionary context. It really didn't work to just classify organisms based on structure and try to form a link because two cocci could be completely unrelated to each other, right? Um, and right. so we had the same problem in the rock record is that you could see these microbial fossils, but you didn't, you know, it looks like a cyanobacterium, but it doesn't tell you anything about its metabolism and its metabolism is what's really impacting its biochemistry. So it's impacting the rock record, right? Um, and so, you know, it was really like Diane's idea to kind of study these in the modern organisms and understand the genes behind them, understand the proteins behind them, how these molecules are made, and then use those also as a marker. And so if you're making a hopinoid and you can think about why modern microbes make hopinoids, do they make them because the temperature is higher? That gives you a signature, not just of the type of organism that was present there, but a signature of the environmental condition that we see in an elevated level of this molecule. And so that was my postdoc project was to identify in a modern organism what are the genes required to make these? And can we use those as markers to understand how environmental factors impact the production of these different molecules? Yeah, and 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 it's something I show your picture and I say your name when I teach about this every year. Thank you. I brag. <laughs> I, I get called an I, I get called a name dropper all the time. But the fact of the matter is that is the only advantage of getting older is you get to know people. That's it. Oh. <laughs> All I was going to say is that you, you make this wonderful point about how do you tell what's going mm -hmm. on when you look at the fossil record. And what I really want to uh, make clear to the listeners and viewers is, is that in this particular molecule, these hopanoids, number one, survives fossilization. Number two, the modifications of that molecule survive fossilization. Number three, this molecule is existent today and can be studied. So that means it's been hanging around for a couple of billion years, which is remarkable. Yeah. yeah. And then and then further, you're able to make inferences about the climate even based on these kinds of things that you see in the fossil record. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, all those connections are important. And all those connections require both studying these in the fossil record and also studying them in the lab with pure cultured organisms. Um, and it is also important, I think, in the middle level that I think um, a lot of environmental geochemists and microbiologists do is study actually in the environment themselves. So you can go into environments today and pull out the hopinoids and pull out and you can see under different conditions when they're there and when they're not there. And then the mm -hmm. really powerful thing is if you know the genes and you're able to sequence all the all the genomic data within, say, a, a you know a hot spring, you can connect the lipid to the organism, and you can start to make shifts in seeing because a lot of organisms produce hopinoids, right? And if you see a hopinoid, you know the microbe was there that was producing it, and it's like it can be cyanobacteria, it can be in an oxygenic phototroph, or it could be some other a, a class, a group of organisms. Mm -hmm. But if in the modern, you can kind of decipher under what conditions you're seeing. Oh, this is when cyanobacteria really. Uh, expressing it because I only, I have the molecule, the organism, and the gene identification that links all three of them. And so I think that's that's, the, that's really powerful. But that 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 is where the gap is right now is in the environmental aspects because we have a lot of geochemical uh, rock record data and we have a lot of laboratory experiments in pure culture and it's kind of merging those two. Yeah. Very well done. But it's not just about hopinoids, as you've been saying to me. Mm -hmm. and, and am I saying that correctly, Paula? You're yes. always very polite. Okay. Yes, hopinoids is correct. <laughs> and that took you to that took you to your next stage? Yeah. So that was the work I was doing as a postdoc. And so when I started to think about wanting to build my own independent research program, I decided to stay in this space because I feel like in reading the biosignature literature, there are a lot of different markers. It's just not hopinoids. There's a lot of membranes are diverse and a lot of lipids are produced by different types of organisms that can be um, preserved in the rock record. And these same questions are present in the literature. Um, you know, we see, for example, cholesterol-like molecules, but we don't understand them as much in modern bacteria, assay in modern eukaryotes. And so that, that link, trying to make that link from a, a physiological genomic point of view in the modern is still missing. And so I started to focus 
I went to the literature and said, what questions need to be answered? And I wrote proposals for, I want to focus on these types of biomarkers. And so I strayed away a little bit from hoponates because there were still a lot of other markers out there mm -hmm. that we didn't know what organisms were producing them. Or if we did, we didn't know how they were making them or if, wonder what conditions they would be expressed. And so I am always say I'm a person who has a biomarker looking for the microbe. And so we're very flexible in my group and the types of organisms that we work with. So I first established my lab with uh, the aerobic methanotroph Methylococcus capsulatus, which is an organism that can take uh, methane gas plus oxygen and make CO2 and generate energy for growth. Um, but it's also one of the few bacteriums that bacterium, bacteria <laughs> that is able to um, produce both hoponoids and sterols. Uh, that was really interesting because hopanoids are thought to be sterile analogs of bacteria because most bacteria don't make things like cholesterol. But this organism produced both. Now, it doesn't make cholesterol because cholesterol takes uh, a lot of modification to get to the final molecule that you and I make. Um, but it makes a, a modified molecule that's actually distinct. It makes this very specific type of sterile for itself. And so the question I had, the basic question is if these are physiologically functional analogs of these, why is Methylococcus making both? <laughs> and so that was kind of the question I set up that I decided to answer. And I was just fascinated by sterols in general because they're so well studied in eukaryotes. I mean, and, and they impact so much of eukaryotic biology. Um, they're important in cell development and cell signaling and human health with cardiovascular disease. Um, and the thinking at the time was oh, bacteria just don't make them. There's an oddball here, there, Methylococcus is an oddball, but I just, and, and then the geochemists used them as biomarkers for eukaryotes and said, oh, too few bacteria make these, so they're not a prominent biomarker for bacteria. And I thought, okay, well, that seems reasonable. Is that really the case? Are there other bacteria that produce sterols? We don't understand what their functional roles are. So I just, as a microbiologist, was just fascinated by this complete disregard of sterile synthesis in bacteria. Um, no, this is, this, this is very interesting, Paula, because mm -hmm. I'm teaching intro biology mm -hmm. for the last time. And, <laughs> and it's truth. Mm -hmm. And and what's interesting about this is that everyone comes to class with this idea that cholesterol is bad. And one of the things that I have to kind of strike them about the head and shoulders about is that it's necessary for all kinds of functions. Mm -hmm. Yes, too much is bad, but it's absolutely necessary. It is the basis for making, quote, steroid hormones. Exactly. And there's nothing that we do where there haven't been precedents in the evolutionary record before. So yeah. the idea of stabilizing membranes using something like cholesterol makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Hoponoids have a different structure, mm -hmm. but I'm not surprised at all to learn that some bacteria make it. And I would add this. Do you remember when you worked in my lab and I told you there were three levels of scientific discovery? No. The first is, <laughs> that's a silly idea and you shouldn't waste any time on it. The second was, well, it's true a little bit in the lab, but it's not relevant to the natural world. Mm -hmm. And the third is, I said it was a good idea all along. And our friend Micheline Wong came up with the fourth one, which is, and I came up with the idea first. <laughs> and, and this is absolutely true. And we always have assumptions about the microbial world, and we don't have a good appreciation for its diversity mm -hmm. and, 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 and its depth and its relatedness. So when I hear things that say, for example, bacteria don't fill in the blank, I get very nervous. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, so and I'm it's glad very you... easy to prove, not the yeah. opposite. Yeah. Right. And I'm glad that you brought your enthusiasm to it. So you, yeah. you don't know yet what kind of functions these sterile like um, molecules have in bacteria. No, we don't. And, and, and one of the interesting things is, is that what has been difficult to study sterols in methylcoccus in particular is the first thing I did when I was still in the lab, when I was setting up my lab, was to try to make a deletion mutant. And it turns <laughs> out that sterols in this particular organism are probably essential. And I tried to do the same thing with the hopanoids. So I, what I wanted to do was create a hopanoid uh, ster uh, sterile mutant, right? A one mm -hmm. hopanoid deletion, sterile deletion, and compare them, right? Do they you know, uh, compensate for each other. I couldn't delete either. Now that's not true in other bacteria. Other bacteria that make hopanoids, we can get rid of the pathway 
And under normal conditions, the organism is fine. At higher temperature, it struggles, right? But in Mephalococcus, I couldn't knock it out either way. And, and this is an unresolved question in my lab um, that I'm always trying to get my students to, and they're all like, we don't want to work <laughs> on that. But for me, that's the most fascinating question because I think essentiality demonstrates an important function. And we haven't mm-hmm. figured that out yet, either for the for hoponoids or sterols in this particular organism because they're interconnected, the pathways branch. And so I think there might be regulatory control going from one to the other that would be really cool to discover. And so that's one of the projects that I am recruiting students to work on right now is to try to take an approach where we look more broadly. We look at a proteomics approach to try to understand what might be interacting with hoponoids, what might be acting with sterols in this particular organism, and try to identify pro, uh, protein pathways that might be help give us some clue as to the function. Oh, that's really awesome. Yeah. And, and you know, uh, the other thing is, I've often talked, and, and I'm sorry to listeners and viewers, uh, the three deadly centrisms is is oxycentrism because we think yeah. that oxygen's the be all and end all. When in fact, how many different oxygen detoxification mechanisms do we have? We have like 10. Yeah. <laughs> because oxygen is actually toxic and toxic. people don't really appreciate that, right? Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. just a place to dump an electron, but oxygen itself is so reactive. Yeah. Uh, the second one is this idea of eukaryocentrism that, you know, we only look at things in terms of eukaryotes, but I would argue that there's a third one. And I'm going to be snide and call it colicentrism, but that's not fair. I'm going to, I need something that says if you can cultivate it and then centrism, because yes. there are many microbes we cannot yet cultivate. And so it's very difficult to understand them. And we tend yeah. to compare them to things we can cultivate. And I don't know that that's good. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, it's interesting. There's this book called Echoes of Life, which traces the history of organic geochemistry, um, written by a scientific writer, um, along with some of the luminaries in organic geochemistry. Um, so I read this book when I started to work with Roger and was thinking about like or, like what the geochemists are interested in. Because that's a big thing about interdisciplinary research. You serve multiple audiences. Like, I'm a protein nerd. I'm a lipid nerd. I just want to study my microbes and I want to discover new proteins. But they are really much more interested in the applications of this. And they're the ones that drive my questions. Like, what do you need me to answer? So I had to learn how to, like, what is it that they focus on? Because that, mm-hmm. not only I provide important information, but then it enables me to be my protein nerd on the side, right? <laughs> and just kind of enjoy my science. And um, But when I read this book, there was an observation by the author that I found was like the perfect encapsulation. Every organism, microbe, that we have in the lab share one thing, and that is that they can be cultivated in the lab. That is the thing that connects them. That is why they we study them, right? And that leaves out the other 99% that cannot be cultivated in the lab. And that's a lot. And so the only thing they all share in common is that, right? And I think that's that's what we're studying. We're studying what can be cultivated in the lab. And that's valuable and it's important, but it only tells part of the story. No, that's 100% true. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, a lot of organisms that we can't cultivate, microbially speaking, often can only exist in concert with other unrelated organisms. Mm-hmm. And we have a fixation on single isolates, things that I'm, I'm being flippant, things that you grow on plates that kind, or things that you grow in liquid. Yeah. We, we've we looked at auger degrading microbes, and Paula, you will love this, that they can't grow unless they're in in they can't grow at all unless there's some auger present. Yeah. <laughs> now they have a fully if you look at their genomes they have all this all the things to live on all kinds of sugars but you have to add like 0.05% auger in liquid to get them yeah. to grow at all and and yeah. I found that out the hard way. Yeah. And it's because I made assumptions. Yes. Right? I grow it on a plate, I should be able to grow it in liquid, but it's a completely different environment. Yeah. And that's with something that you can cultivate. Yeah. Now imagine something that you can't cultivate very well. Yeah. yeah. And actually, like one of the projects that I have a student working on right now is on uh, sterile production in mixobacteria. Um, and so she was fascinated by this because she found sterile synthesis genes within the mixobacteria. And we've known a few mixobacteria can make sterols. What she discovered um, is that they can actually make cholesterol. So we actually have 
a few myxobacteria that have the full pathway to get to cholesterol. And the problem with these organisms, they don't grow in liquid culture. They, they are predatory uh, swarming bacteria, so they only grow on plate. And the reason people were not able to see cholesterol before is because it was such low biomass from the having to grow them on an E. coli auger plate, right? And then uh, Alicia would just scrape off the cells and we had such small biomass that we couldn't do a proper lipid extraction. So she found out that you could also grow them in liquid if you grew them in dead E. coli. So she started growing them in dead E. coli, would add a clump of cells uh, from the auger plate, and then they would clear the culture. And she'd end up with this lump of myxobacteria at the bottom. Now that's not really growing in culture, right? Because they're not, you're not seeing, I mean, growing in liquid, because you're not seeing that. But we got a big old mass that allowed us to do a proper lipid extraction and then found cholesterol in there. Um, but again, if we would have stuck to something that could grow on plates properly, form colonies, and can grow in liquid culture. I mean, we can't do genetics on this organism, and that's fine. We're trying to do other approaches to try to study this. It forces us to think outside of our toolkit, um, which mm -hmm. is nice. Um, and so it's a hard project because, you know, our, our go-to are gene deletion. So we can do that pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, and so it's a challenging project, but it's really exciting because you have, for the first time, a bacterium that can make cholesterol. And there's an analogy to what we have in eukaryotes, but there's also differences at the, you know, protein level that we hadn't anticipated. And so there's this idea then, you know, that these organisms, the ones that aren't culturable, the ones that are difficult to grow, you know, can give us insight into how the pathways evolved, can show us that there are multiple routes to get to the same molecule. Um, they just provide a lot of wealth of information that we're missing if, as you say, we stick to just E. coli. <laughs> no, no. And... And, and, and I'm really glad that you said something earlier that I'd intended to say. It is really easy to hear something that I didn't intend. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not putting down work, say, with E. coli or salmonella or bacillus or the ones that are genetically tractable. And this is a problem when I teach class because often the process of growing things in the lab causes evolution to occur, yeah. a la Rich Lensky, hat yeah. tip. These things do take place over time, so they're not quite the same organism as they were before. Mm -hmm. I know that Roberto Coulter and, oh my goodness, his uh, uh, wonderful professor at Harvard, whose name I can't recall right now, who also worked on this. Richard the point Losick. I'm trying... Uh, pardon me? Richard Losick. Thank you. Yeah. Good old, good old Dick Losick for this. Yeah. And in fact, they do change just in the process of being passaged to grow in the lab. So that's once again, an assumption that we're making. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to maintain things that are truly what that term wild type is. Yeah. And this is, is, this is a really important thing to keep in mind. Sometime, I'm, I'm, students will hear me say about structural genomics, you're not doing any experiments, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's some truth to that. But that's also the only way you can study some organisms. Yeah. And that's important yeah. to remember. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think so. So that brought you to mixo to fatty mixobacteria, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So fatty mixobacteria, we're studying cholesterol in that organism. Um, and so that's, we continue to explore the diversity of potential cholesterol producers. And we're really kind of trying to get into the nitty gritty details of, um, looking at the, uh, the regulation of this and how that compares to what we might see previously in, in eukaryotic systems. And we're hoping we're going to discover novel mechanisms of regulation for sterols in bacteria. And I, that's really kind of where we're going with that. Um, and I think also um, beyond that, um, we've started to look at lipids in the archaea is another area that we're looking that goes beyond these um, sterile-like, hoponol-like, because archaea actually do not make any hoponoid or sterile-like molecules. And so how do we trace archaea in the rock record? And how do we uh, understand their physiology when, as you said, we're very focused on things that have been cultured, but the archaea are proven to be quite a wealth of diversity that's distinct from what we see in bacteria. So you've been looking a little bit, I know, at some therm... Um, I'm, can I call them hyperthermophiles? Yes, hyperthermophiles. Yeah. So hyperthermophiles uh, live above 80 degrees C, which is mighty toasty. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. And if you think about like a phospho, oh, excuse me, they're not using phospholipids the way that we're talking about it. You know, they have this different kind of cell membrane, but I've often wondered, is that true for all archaea? More about that will become clear in future episodes, I suspect, mm-hmm. of this podcast. But what I will say is that those membranes are going to be vibrating because that's what heat really is, is molecular yeah. motion. Mm-hmm. And how do you hold them together? And I know that some literally connect both leaves of mm-hmm. their lipid bilayer yeah. to give them this strength. Yes. But I, so what have you found? That is exactly the thing that has fascinated people that have looked at the membranes of archaea. So if we think about the membranes of archaea, they're actually distinct from those of bacteria and eukaryotes. You can lump the bacteria and the eukaryotes phospholipids together, right? We have this fatty acid that's ester linked to a glycerol 3 phosphate. In archaea, we have an isoprenoid based chain. It's not fatty acids. And that's really important because these isoprenoid chains are highly methylated, whereas fatty acid chains are not methylated. The other thing is the pathways to, they might look the same. They just look like lipid chains, right? <laughs> but when you think about the biosynthetic pathways, completely different pathways to make. Um, now, for example, we, all organisms make these isoprenoid chains, but archaea are the only ones that then take them and make them their main membrane lipid. Like we use them as quinones, we use them to make small molecules and other things. But for archaea, they're like, nope, we're going to make this as our main membrane structure. They then ether link them rather than ester link them to the isomer of glycerol 3 phosphate, glycerol 1 phosphate. And so they have this different chemical composition. But you're right, they still form this bilayer like we see in bacteria and eukaryotes, right? Um, But the fusing of this diether that they have into a tetraether was is wild, right? And what's even more wild is they then take this this uh, monolayer and start adding rings, cyclopentane rings into it. And you're like, what are you doing? <laughs> and so um, for a long time, it wasn't understood how they do that, how they fuse it and how they are able to add the rings. Um, and so what my research group did is we decided to try to discover the proteins that were involved in this process. So why do we care? Why do we want to do this? So if we look in the past, the GDGTs are not as well preserved as the, sorry, the GDGTs is the tetraether. I'm going to use that term a lot. GDGT, sorry. Um, so these lipid molecules from the archaea are not preserved as far back as the sterols and the hoponoids. They go back maybe 100 million years, but that's still pretty good. And what was discovered, so these lipids were studied more in modern environments by uh, geochemists that like to study these molecules in modern marine sediments. And what they found was that adding these rings, when they looked across global data sets of where they're present in marine sediments, they found that ones with rings were more present in uh, warmer oceans than colder oceans, right? And this pattern holds across a global data set. And so they decided to start using these as sea surface temperature indicators in the past. And they would generate ratios, different types of ratios, depending on the number of rings that they can get in the fossilized uh, molecules that they found. And the reason that's important is a lot of the work that we do in climate science and thinking about how the earth has changed over time, how the earth was impacted by different um, warming events is to look at past records, look at current records, and then model into the future, right? And so these past records can help ground truth models that we have in the future because we have other indicators that let us know what the, t- what the temperature was, and then we can enter that into a model for that's predicting mm-hmm. to, what's happening today, and that corroborates. And then you, you feel a little bit more uh, secure in your model that is predicting the future. So a lot of climate no. science is dependent on paleoclimatology. But the problem that we have using these archaeolipids is we don't know how they're made, right? And some people started to study them. This is marine, so this is not the hyperthermophiles yet, but they started to study them in marine cultures and and organisms that were in single culture in the lab. And that correlation to temperature and rings was not as strong. So what we saw in the environment was a strong signal, but what we saw in pure culture was a weak signal. And so you have these two data sets that are really good and the connection is the problem. So in the field right now, what we're trying to do is understand this discrepancy, right? You can make the case as we are making that in pure culture, you're dealing with one organism, not in its native environment. 
But in the environment, you're not even dealing with the organisms. You're just dealing with the production of the lipids at, and using kind of a global scale and, you know, um, uh, statistics to kind of get a, a good ratio. And so how do we connect those? And our argument was you need to understand the biochemistry and then you can make a connection between pure culture, modern environment and the past. And so we ended up doing that. I had a wonderful postdoc, Ray Zhang, who is now a professor uh, in, uh, in China. And he was able to identify these proteins. And we focus on a hyperthermophile, even though for the paleoclimate people, the marine archaea are the most important. Um, we had to focus on the hyperthermophiles because those were the ones that we could grow in the lab. And those were the ones that we have genetic systems that we could test this out in. But we made the assumption that there would be a correlation in the biochemistry and it turned out to be true. So we were able to identify the protein that added the rings. Um, and one of the outstanding questions in the, in the paleoclimate record in the marine environment is what was the source? What organisms are producing the rings? And when we right. found the ring protein, we can then go back to the metagenomic data and show that there was one source in the marine environment which is really exciting because if you look in the water column, there's a ton of different types of archaea. So any one of these archaea could have been producing, but based on the genetics, on the genomes, the ones that are most predominant in these environments are the nitrosacaceae. Uh, and so it's this one specific group of archaea. And so that really helps constrain the biomarker, the biosignature, because if you have multiple groups producing then you don't know which one is the one. So it allows us to then focus on those to do more environmental and lab studies potentially. So it's a way that the information can help you constrain these biomarkers in the present that helps kind of us interpret the past a little bit better. Um, so this comes, this comes back to echoes. They're mm -hmm. echoes of the past. Yes. Yes, there are echoes of the past. And, you know, one of the things that really surprised me working with geologists is how much of this is storytelling, how much of this is getting this data and trying to tell the best, most uh, parsimonious, you know, story that you can get to. And it really is a lot about putting these puzzle pieces together. And I really got, a, you know, a lot of respect for the geologists and the geochemists because sometimes the signals they have are so weak, but they're able to kind of put together a story that later proves to be half right or this is wrong. And there is a lot of work towards kind of moving the story we say about how evolution occurred, how microbes evolved, how the environment was impacted, this, this co-evolution of life and earth, how, they, how these two systems pushed and pulled on each other based on, you know, geochemical records, isotope records, and everything. It's, it's really a refinement. And it's something that I, you know, when you think about, are we ever really going to know the full story? Well, if someone builds us a time machine, we'll be able to go back and see. <laughs> but you know, the story that we have keeps getting refined. And, you know, scientists like myself and the students that I'm training are contributing to this. And we're yeah. continuing to contribute to this story. And I think this is why I love geobiology. It is a, a field that people are very adamant and passionate about their hypotheses, but also very open to new techniques, new ways of thinking and bringing in new ideas. And with a little pushing, we can get new new thoughts, new lines of evidence, new hypotheses coming in and out that we can, you know, have healthy conversations about. So, Paula, one of the things that that I think is very interesting is how all of this kind of connects to the origin of life itself. Now, we know that some of the signature molecules last longer than others. So can you make any like thoughts about how biosignatures could be used to look toward the origins of life? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, the biosignatures that we look at, in particular the lipids, are not preserved that far back, right? Um, you know, the origins of life is thought to be about 4 billion, 3.8 billion years ago. And so those, the chemicals just do not withstand the preservation um, the, um, that far, that deep in time. Uh, as Roger would say, they're cooked. <laughs> you can't see them. So that's something about this. These bio, you need to have, they're not present in all rocks that are 2 billion years old. You need to have rocks that are formed under specific certain conditions where these specific lipid molecules are going to be retained. And so whether or not they, we can link them to the origins of life is actually particularly the lipids is not possible, but there are other, as you mentioned earlier, other types of mo molecules such as isotope signatures that are indicative of life signatures that we could potentially see deep, deep in time. So that's how the link might be made, but it will, they, you, I don't think you can directly 
identify and show the evolution through molecules in the mm -hmm. rock record um, to indicate the origins or the evolution of life. The, the preservation potential just isn't there. You know, it's interesting because I, I love fossils and, and I was able to go to this quarry in upstate New York where you get these pyrotized trilobite fossils that include all the soft parts oh, okay. and, uh, in, in great detail, but you don't see them normally. So this talk, this really speaks to your example from a moment ago, mm -hmm. kind of depends upon the formations themselves and yes. how they formed. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why you need ge geologists and geochemists to be partners in this because they're the ones that are going to find them in the right conditions. You know, and Hazel Barton actually said that that she finds herself becoming more and more of a geologist over time, which is, is kind of interesting, <laughs> mm -hmm. that kind of that interconnection. It's it's an interesting thought, too, when you when you think about biosignatures of life in general. So we have particular signatures that we can associate with bacteria that sometimes survive in the fossil record. Ditto with what I'm going to call archaea. Mm -hmm. Are there any signatures for things like viruses? I say that because some viruses have envelopes mm -hmm. and potentially, now that's true, they're butted off from host cells, but it made me think perhaps we would see evidence of them. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. I am not sure what the signatures of viruses would be and how you would distinguish in the context of the membrane a viral signature versus a bacterial signature. Because as you mentioned, they butt off and usually the membrane is either synthesized by the machinery in the bacterium or is very similar to what we see in the host organism. I mean, you know, the are like the differences between bacteria and archaea is even prevalent in their viruses and the the virus the pro the lipids that they have in their uh, capsids are the ones from archaea and the ones from birds, uh, from bacteria. So I don't know how you would distinguish that actually. I think viruses is an area where a lot of people particularly like in the metagenomic world are starting to really uh, pay attention to and try to find signatures within genomes. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering yeah. if eventually we'll have a distinct signature that is actually preserved that can be indicative from a virus. And it might exist now, and I'm just not aware of it because I'm not in that literature, but this is definitely an area that's probably wide open. This has been so important. We've had recent episodes with Jen Biddle, mm -hmm. um, you know, who looks at, at sediment microbes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's a lot having to do with the geochemistry of what's taking place there. Mm -hmm. And of course, the the inimitable Hazel Barton with cave microbiology. Yes. And, yes. and one of the things that struck me then and strikes me now with your own discussion is how looking at it from two points of view increases what you can see. You know, if I cover up one eye, I'm not going to see as much depth as when I use two. And in mm -hmm. some ways, we become too narrow in what we study. Yeah. And I do think, you know, having different voices, different faces, different eyes, really important. Yes. And it's true from the personal nature and it's true professionally. Yes. So I'm, I'm really excited by this work because so many times people are dogmatic. This is what archaea do. Mm -hmm. This is what bacteria do. And, mm -hmm. you know, all respect to very famous people who say things like that, but not so much. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, science is about change. You know, science is about, you know, having your hypothesis, but accepting when your hypothesis is wrong, right? And we change our mind all the time. And I yeah. think when, you're, when it's evidence-based, it's not like we're waffling. It's just no. we are incorporating new information and then moving forward. And it moves the whole field forward. So there's been things, even in my own laboratory experience, I thought I was looking for one particular thing, and it turned out I was looking at something else, but yeah. it appeared like the earlier thing. I won't go into detail with it, but Bill Metcalf used to say to me, you know, these screens are not for your benefit. <laughs> you know, the microbes have their own agenda, Maybe. and it's not yours. Yeah. And, and that's why, you know, I've always said I don't believe a particular finding until I see it multiple times. Yeah. And, and, and that's really hard. A student comes in having found something really cool, yeah. you know, and then it doesn't pan out and they're so disappointed. And I have to keep saying, no, no, this is how science progresses. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm really excited to hear that. I yeah. mean, what, what, once Paula, we thought that we, we could see the advantages of bacteria that make light versus those that don't. 
by genetically marking the strains and putting them in competition. Yeah. But the problem was, is I never bothered to check the fitness yes. of the mutation. And I found out, for example, streptomycin resistance really messes up bacteria. Yeah. And it makes yeah. sense when you, when you think about what a ribosome is, is made up exactly. of, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and so we learn from that. And that's, yeah. that's kind of, and that's one of the things that I want this podcast to really teach mm -hmm. people is science is a process. It isn't, um, engraved on stone tab on stone tablets and handed down that's yeah. the advantage to science yeah, yeah. and it you also know. isn't like the aha moment that people think they think you're looking in the microscope and aha i discovered the whole thing it's a lot of trial and error and actually where we make the big discoveries is in the places where we think we mess up right yeah. <laughs> it's like what did i do i messed this up and you discover something completely different and it was ralph wolf who told me that like that's where the big discoveries are made if you're chasing yeah. what everyone is chasing but then you go down your own path you start he what did he say you you'll start to lead the parade rather than be in the parade <laughs> so it was always keeping an eye out for those things so this is like really interesting and i've really appreciated the stories that you're telling us mm -hmm. and i do want to point out that you have a new job yes or mm -hmm. a part of your job because yes. you know the thing with paula that i don't think the viewer or listener appreciates is she has an endless amount of energy and i don't believe you have a breaking point i'm not sure but I'm not sure that you do because what happens with people like Paula is they get given more things to do <laughs> until I guess that the goal is to, for you to say, I can't do any more, but you haven't found that yet. So now you're an associate dean of? Diversity, equity, and inclusion for the Door School at Stanford. <laughs> yeah. And that's like a big deal. So your idea there, just as you're looking at the diversity of microbes and the way that they go about things, you want to bring diversity to science itself. Absolutely. Yeah, that has been something of a goal for me. So I think, you know, if I think back and look at my academic career, I had so many wonderful mentors, including yourself, who helped guide me through the path of academia. It's a tough path. It's a hard path. And it's hard to know what to do next and how to do it best. And so with you and Bill Metcalf, Diane Newman and Roger Summons, I feel like I had a group of people that were really kind of guiding me um, through what is a difficult um, mm -hmm. uh, trajectory. Um, and even here, like once you, you land your faculty position, there's a lot of work that has to be done to get you to a position where you are a little bit more uh, stable. <laughs> um, but I, I really feel that I was supported and people wanted me to work. So my intention when I started my faculty position was I was going to mentor the heck out of my students, right? I was going to do the same thing. I was going to pull students up. And in particular, as a Latina, I really wanted students mm -hmm. that were from different backgrounds. You know, I wanted to change the face of academia, and I thought I could do it one student at a time. And I found myself at one point in mid-career here mentoring a student and telling them all the different ways they had to change to be a successful scientist in academia. Mm -hmm. And I remember catching myself and thinking, why am I telling this beautiful, wonderful person to not be themselves mm -hmm. in this space? And in the instant, it hit me that one, am I being complicit in a system <laughs> that is difficult to work in? And is that really my goal? Is really my goal to tell my students to turn themselves into, a, you know, like a square peg that's trying, they're a circle that's trying to fit into a square peg, but, you know, maybe the, the, the square peg needs to change and that being Stanford and that being the academic institutions. And it was in that moment that I started to think about what the problems were in academia. And, you know, in the past it was access. These institutions did not provide access to people, right? They, they were segregated that you couldn't come to these schools if you were from a certain background. I think that's gone. And I think what we have now is much harder is something that is unconscious that we do structurally and that there is, inherent structural barriers within our institutions that prevent us from creating an academic field and academic um, environment that is conducive to having all kinds of voices. And so part of my role is now is to think about how I can make Stanford better in this respect. And I think a lot of the work that we do is trying to challenge those of us that are in power, those of us that are opening the doors and closing the doors. What is it that we're doing that is not allowing students that are from all walks of life to succeed in this structure. Um, and so I'm still mentoring students and pulling them up because, you know, they have to make it through this academic, um, 
you know, uh, trajectory as it is as we're trying to fix it from the other end at the same time. But it is about kind of uh, educating my colleagues about, you know, we're so used to like, for example, when we do graduate admissions or when we do faculty hiring, hiring, we're comfortable hiring people that look like us, that are like, that do what we do. And or think and, like us? And who think like us, exactly. Mm -hmm. And this is really particularly important as our fields become more interdisciplinary, right? If you bring in a young scientist that is working in a field that intersects two fields and is a little different than what you're used to, it's hard for you to accept them and evaluate them, right? And so it's really about us figuring out as the ones who manage and run these institutions, how do we open up these barriers within ourselves to allow the space for success? You know, how do we measure academic success? Are the traditional um, metrics that we're using appropriate, you know, for this particular individual? And thinking about that more broadly. And so that my DI work works a lot on kind of both ends and making sure that we're supporting our students, supporting our faculty in all kinds of different ways to succeed here. But at the same time, looking internally and seeing what are the things that we need to do in my department, in my school, in my university to allow us to be more open and more accessible to everyone who wants to be a scientist here. I think that's very, very well put. And you know what I can say, and and, and I want to be very careful when I say this. Uh, there, uh, I've had kind of a circuitous route in academia myself because I'm not like most people. This is not the same thing as many people in underrepresented groups. I'm a first generation person, yes, but I think you'll agree I'm a bit out of the norm. Mm -hmm. And and I had a person who was a big supporter of mine, Paula. And I don't mean any disrespect to this person who told me when I was doing a series of job interviews to be less Markish. <laughs> now, again, you know, it's easy to kind of, I know the person meant well, I know they yeah. did. Okay. And I brought that up with someone whose name that, you know, Abigail Salyers, the late Abigail Salyers and Hurricane Abigail had very strong opinions on this. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a whole blog post about it because what she told me, it was important for me to be myself. And I think you would agree that, Abigail was always herself. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, and and then I said, well, what if I'm too much as it is? And he said, she said, number one, that's not true. And number two, you're never going to be happy at a place where you have to hide who you are. Exactly. And this is so true for everyone. So mm -hmm. authenticity is so important. Mm -hmm. That means that we have to look at people as individuals. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. I can do that. I'm, I'm not a fabulous teacher. I'm certainly not a great researcher, but I am because I'm looking at a product, a great talent <laughs> scout. Yes. I am a good talent scout. And that, and that is because I can look at the individual and build a relationship with that individual. And that's really hard to do institutionally. Yes, so, it is. So, you know, that, that's my challenge is, mm -hmm. is how do you create that kind of environment? Yeah. And, and in, in a way, if you'll forgive me from quoting Harry Potter, I, I, I used to want to be Gryffindor. But the truth of the matter is that I'm really Hufflepuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's right? okay. And you should be Hufflepuff. Uh, yeah. You know, and, I, and I think that the, it's, it is, um, you know, I think it, it works both ways. We do have to mm -hmm. have everybody be themselves because one, that's how you make big discoveries. That's how you really move mm -hmm. science forward when you have different ways of thinking embedded in this. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's not always safe for everyone to be themselves, right? Because there yes. are expectations and there are repercussions. And so it's incumbent on people like me to be able to create that space and say to those that are like in power, be like, no, this person can be themselves and they can be successful and we can allow that to happen. And so it, it, it's very, I think for us, it's important that we nurture that in our students and that we nurture that in our colleagues um, at the same time thinking about what is the impact going to be on them. Other people are more allowed to do that than others. And I think that's really important. Yeah. I mean, and it comes back to just exactly what I said. What do you do with a person? I'll, I'll give you, it's going to sound like a flippant, um, a flippant kind of example, but it's not. What if you're teaching a class that is based a whole bunch on, on interacting with the professor and one another, and you have a super quiet student? Yeah. That super quiet student has a whole lot to contribute. Yeah. You have to create an environment where that student feels, I hate using the word safe, but in uh -huh. this context, it's correct. Yeah. Safe enough to feel supported in their ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. And, and, and that's kind of what we need to do all up and down the board because, you know, I have the silly lapel pins that say science is for everyone and that's aspirational, not factual. Yeah. yeah. No, it's <laughs> yeah. true. Right. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And, and I can't, and, and again, your whole career has been about like finding different viewpoints and different ways of looking at things. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'm delighted you're continuing to do that and now have some degree of, I hate using the word power because, yeah. you know, I get the Roman empire in my yes. head, which I'm not supposed to have. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah. You know the song. But yes. <laughs> the point the point I'm trying to get at is that now you can actually affect those doors that open and close. Yeah. And I think it's important that we recognize that. I think as um, you know, someone who's in this position, I do I do understand that. And I think a lot of times my colleagues don't, right? And and I think that's just something that we have to kind of uh encourage people also to be like, you know, yes, this is difficult and change needs to be, you know undertaken and you're the one that can do it <laughs> and so that's also prodding people along to be like you're the one that can be supportive you're the one that can challenge this administrator you're the one and um you know it's it's a lot of work but it's good work and it's work when you know balanced out with being in your aqua students which is you know is kind of the you know when i have administrative meetings all day i come into the lab and have a student come in who wants to talk science and it's like my day is perfect then. It's like, okay, <laughs> let's just talk about your, your growth curve here and what's wrong. <laughs> oh, 100%. Yeah. You, you know, I, I don't know if you know this, but I minored in psychology uh, back at UCLA. Oh, and, know, no. and, and there's a, a well, I, I found the courses relatively easy. So mm -hmm. I was doing it. I used to think I wanted to be a counselor. Wouldn't that be nutty? But <laughs> in any event, what I would say to you is there's an idea called Maslow's Hammer. Have you ever heard of it? Mm -mm. So Abraham Maslow was a psychologist and Maslow's hammer basically put is that if all you know is a hammer, you see everything as a nail. Yeah. So we're kind of the product of our backgrounds. And exactly. that's not necessarily, oh, I would argue it's never a good thing, honestly, because you have to be open to new ideas and new experiences mm -hmm. and we have to avoid Maslow's hammer. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't things that you like, for example, if you're good at looking at proteins, you want to continue to look at proteins. Yeah. But if you want to create a, a, a more inclusive environment, sometimes you have to remove yourself from what you're used to. And that's very difficult for many people to do. Yeah. It's a struggle, I would say, for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I struggle with it, right? And I, you know, I have this role and, and I have the same um, difficulties that everyone has, you know, and I think it's it's a work in progress and it's work we're never done doing and i think that's the the the, the in, in di work a lot of times you probably oh when are you going to be done when are you gonna be? like you're never going to be done <laughs> and, and that's just the, what you have to accept as part of you know what it is it's just we live in a diverse community in a diverse society there's always going to be these tensions and what we need to do is be able to hold these tensions in our in ourselves in our hearts in our minds and understand that they just exist and work with them, right? And I think that's really important. Like our past, who we are is so important and what we know is so important, but it's understanding that what we don't know can enhance that is really, really the key. It is, it is. There's a um, something that I put up in my classes whenever I teach and the three agreements of my classroom. And, and you know, the first is you don't presume ill intent. Right. 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 It, there can be ill intent, yeah, but you don't presume it. Mm -hmm. Secondly is you cannot mind read. Everyone thinks they can mind read. Trust me, you don't want to read minds, yeah. right? Yeah. And third, and this is so important, is to grant grace to others. Yeah. And it sounds narcissistic, but I want to be part of a system that I'd feel happy to be part of. Yes. Yeah. And. Now you can say, so you just want Planet Mark. And and, and I don't because Planet Mark would be boring. <laughs> yes. But a place where I would feel comfortable, where everyone would talk like you and I are talking about things, yeah. that's an ideal. Yeah, exactly. And that's something that we can all do a part of, I think. Yeah, yeah absolutely. In, in addition, do you remember Joe, Han Joe Handelsman's mm -hmm. PNAS paper about implicit and, and unconscious bias? Uh, yeah. I'm going to put a link to that in the show notes because that's that's really eye-opening. 
Yeah, and it's great. And it's really wonderful to put that there because a lot of times we have found that the best way to combat that is just to let people know they exist. And then you catch it in yourself all the time. I, I have a lot of uh, implicit biases. Um, but I think, um, you know, just being aware of it. I mean, there was a study that was done in um, – um, conference organizers and how they were organizing their conference talks and you know w the number of women that were represented in these was very low and simply sending an email to the conference organizer and say hey we noticed that you're you know this is a little off can you take a look and instantly they would go oh yeah I hadn't even thought about it and they go through and then you got much more gender balance at these conferences just through mm -hmm. that that prompting and so it's it's something as easy as you know it, no one has bad intentions no one's trying to you know prevent access or create these situations it's just we grew up in a certain society and those things are inherent in us and we all have them and that's okay what you know what's not okay is not trying to fix it right <laughs> and so it's it's important to remember i guess it's the william faulkner quote that mm -hmm. the past isn't dead it isn't even past Exactly. And, and, and so, so that means that our, our history is with us at all times mm -hmm. and it's up mm -hmm. to us to try and create this better place mm -hmm. that yeah. honestly, I feel that maybe as a culture, we haven't done enough of, of late. So that's editorializing, but I think you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. You know, and yeah. And we carry our past with us in our genes, right? Our genes is a yeah. record of the, of our, our history here. And now, you know, through this, that your so. cholesterol is the other record you're going to leave behind. <laughs> <laughs> well, you you know, I've really enjoyed this 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 session we've had, Paula. We've talked about all kinds of cool things. We've talked about stromatolites. Mm -hmm. We have talked about cholesterol. We have talked about uh, cyanobacteria. We've talked about hyperthermophiles, and we've talked about access and diversity in in science. So I think it's been a very very useful session, and I want to thank you for your time with us today. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful. It's been wonderful to see you again and interact and talk about science and all the things going on. And I'm, I'm so happy that you invited me. Thank you. I'm, I'm so happy. But would you please give my best to your, your, your lovely family? I cannot believe how much time has passed. I know. I know. So. <laughs> Thanks again, Paula. Thank you. Bye. I am, I am so proud of you. Thank you. <laughs> this has been Matters Microbial a weekly podcast about the wonders of our microbial world and the people who study it. You can send questions, suggestions, or comments to me at mattersmicrobial at gmail.com. Show notes from today's episode, with wonderful links as usual, can be found at microbe.tv slash mm. If you like our work, please consider supporting us at microbe.tv slash contribute. I'm Doc Martin, and you can find me in the biology department of the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma, Washington. My hero, Dr. Paula Wielander, is in the Earth System Sciences Division at Stanford University. Many, many thanks to David Renata for superb editing and Reber Clark for the wonderfully quirky music that I enjoy every week. I hope that you've enjoyed being part of our quality quorum today. See you next time on Matters Microbial.